Hello, I'm Gus Silke, the director of Faith Formation at St. Babel here in Mishawaka, Indiana. And today I want to look at the sacrament of baptism. Uh, as I pondered this at the beginning, uh, as I was preparing this, I thought it was really important to understand that baptism and the gift of joy go together, I think. When you look at the story in the uh, Old Testament of Nehemiah and Ezra, as they are assembling the people, as they're restoring, uh, they're, they're coming in to uh, restore Jerusalem, um, there's a, a moment there where they hear the words of the law and the people weep when they hear the words of the law. And uh, Ezra is proclaiming the word and he says, do not be sad, do not weep, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. I believe that as we ponder the gift of the sacrament of baptism, which is the doorway into our Christian life, um, we, we realize it's a, it's a similar dynamic. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. And so there's this, this combination in the grace of baptism of death and resurrection. And so there is, there's, there is a, a sorrow that comes from the fact that we're separate from God through our sin. And we need to turn to God and turn to God with our separation. In fact, uh, one of the uh, words in, that connotes sin, say in German, is sunda, which means to separate, to rend. And indeed, we feel this all around us in these days. We feel that power of that separation. We're separated from our loved ones through estrangement. We're separated from our friends through disputes. We're separated from our fellow citizens due to uh, strong words of, of debate and uh, strong uh, language uh, of separation in our political discourse right now. There's all kinds of separation. There's arguments about uh, many things uh, and people are feeling that isolation and that separation from the what I consider to be the power of sunda, sin. And yet God does not leave us orphans. God does not leave us orphans in despair. God comes to help us with the grace of baptism. This is the good news. And uh, the good news is that the joy of the resurrection renews the whole world. I, I think, too, about the prayer that I uh, wrote out for my father. My father asked me about six or seven years before he died uh, to write him a prayer. And uh, I'm not going to recite the whole prayer here, but one of the lines of the prayer was, Fill me with joy and love. Fill me with joy and love. And uh, uh, as I get older, uh, I ponder that prayer that my dad said in the last seven years before he died. Uh, Fill me with joy and love. Well, baptism fills us with joy and love if we allow it to. Um, and 
as I have worked here at St. Babel's for the last uh, 31 years, it's going on 32, um, my primary responsibility has been to bring other people um, on their, w with me and with their sponsors and with the uh, community of St. Babel's Parish on the journey to the sacraments and especially in the rite of Christian initiation of adults through the journey to baptism and the other sacraments of, of initiation, that is Eucharist and confirmation. And uh, during this time, those people have taught me a lot about baptism, indeed. So I wanted to share with you some of the things I've experienced uh, from the wisdom of these people who have made this journey to baptism. Um, they've opened my eyes to a deeper sense of what baptism means. One of them was an adult lady who came for baptism. And just by happenstance in those days, I forgot to get the paperwork for her on her baptism. So I, uh, as, you, as you may know, in the Catholic Church, we often uh, and almost always baptize adults on uh, the Easter Vigil. Uh, that would be Holy Saturday night, the Saturday before, I mean the Saturday uh, immediately uh, prior to Easter Sunday, right? So it's Holy Saturday. And so we went through the uh, baptism and so on. And I forgot to get the paperwork. So I had to go back in to the office on Easter Sunday morning and call her up to, to, to fill out the forms for the parish paperwork. I learned not to do that again. But uh, what was, I, I was talking to her and I brought up her experience. Like I asked her very straightforwardly over the phone, what was it like to be baptized? And she said to me, well, you know, when the water came over me, Jesus came inside of me. And I was dumbstruck, like, Wow, what a statement. When the water came over me, Jesus came inside of me. We often don't think about baptism that way. We sometimes think, well, I mean, there's many things we think about baptism. We, we tend, I, I, my experience is we tend to look at it as like a purification ritual like the baptism of John the Baptist. We turn away from our sins and, and God purifies us through this water. And that's true. But what this lady said got to the heart of it. The reason the water cleanses us and purifies us is because when the water comes over us, Jesus comes inside of us. It's pretty remarkable. I've never forgotten that, her, her telling me that. Another time, I had the privilege of, of, you know, being called upon to catechize a seventh grade child who had come to us uh, who had not been baptized and had not been taught anything, had not been catechized. And I, uh, I what I do in those situations is, you know, I got her a, a, a catechist from the parish, a, a wonderful lady who was trying to teach her to get her ready for baptism. And she hit a snag. She hit an obstacle. There was something kind of blocking this child's understanding of what this was about. So this catechist called me up and asked me to help. And I didn't know quite how to break the, whatever it was, the log jam inside of her mind that was holding her back. So uh, I tried something, and uh, this, is, this comes under the heading of 
the old story of the woodpecker that was pecking at the great big tree at the same time that the lightning bolt hit it. And, uh, and that's what happened here. What I did as the catechetical woodpecker, as it were, is I took a crucifix and I held it up to her and I was explaining to her, I was sitting in my office uh, at my desk in a chair. And she, she and the catechist were sitting there uh, across from me. And I held the crucifix up to this girl. And I just said, gaze upon this. And she did. And, and her first reaction, I'll never forget, it was, ugh, like, yuck. Is that awful? What an awful thing! I mean, she said, like, like, I, I, it was too much for her to look at this suffering. And I said, please, please, it's it's more to it than that. There's more to it than that. Just hold on here. I said, look again. He did all this. He suffered all this for you. And he loves you. And if you were the only person in the world that needed this, he would go through the whole thing for you. And I said, you know, things of that nature to her. And she suddenly, the lightning bolt hit her at the same time that I, the catechetical uh, woodpecker, was trying with my meager words to get through to her and suddenly she had like a revelation of love and she said oh oh this is wonderful he really does love me oh my heavens i i, I mean i mean that's sort of how she responded it, uh jesus broke through that and i saw it happen and uh, just a few words of mine, but it wasn't my words. I mean, I was trying to cooperate with the Holy Spirit, but it was the Lord. The Lord showed up as he, as he loves to do. And it was amazing. And of course, the log jam in her catechesis was broken. And she went back and received the rest of the doctrinal teaching from that catechist that I had assigned to her. And she went through at the Easter Vigil, and she came back to St. Bavos about, well, heck, uh, she was, I think, a senior in college. And she came up to me at the reception after the Easter Vigil, and she reintroduced herself to me because she looked very different. And she said, do you remember that day in your office when you held up the crucifix? And you explained it to me? And I said, yeah. I, how could I forget? And she said, well, I'm still going to church. I'm still trying to follow Jesus. And I want to thank you for that. Well, I, I tell that story because obviously we all have those kind of blockages that this seventh grader had in our minds and we all need to kind of keep turning back to the Lord to get rid of those blockages as it were and obviously the the rite of baptism that the church celebrates helps us do that if we can ponder its deep meaning okay and we're going to get to that uh, uh, after uh, one other story um, there was another time that I had a particularly, uh, uh, what, what shall we say, a squirrely third grader. He couldn't settle down. He was constantly restless, and uh, he was very hard to teach. Uh, and uh, But he was called to receive the sacraments, and we were doing the best he, we could. He came from a broken family. And, um, but he was, he was wiggly and squirmy and, uh, uh, he even kind of, uh, embarrassed me, uh, at the rite of, uh, 
uh, election, you know, that's when we take the catechumens to meet the bishop. I mean, and the bishop, and this was Bishop Darcy, and this kid was just at the reception. He was kind of dancing around, not, I mean, uh, uh, trying to get the bishop's attention, uh, waving a peace sign with his hands at the bishop. Um, I remember I, I told the, uh, 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 the pastor who had not been at that right, so I was reporting back to him at the rectory at the time uh, uh, about what this kid did. And, and the pastor looked at me and he said, well, at least he wasn't uh, 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 flashing a, uh, a bad signal to the bishop. He was flashing a peace sign. And I thought, well, okay. In other words, he saw that the glass was half full rather than half empty. But I was embarrassed. Uh, I, I admit, I was embarrassed. But this kid was just like that. Well, we get to the Easter vigil, and this kid is kneeling down with the other catechumens, getting ready to receive the sacrament of baptism. And he's squirming and squirrely, and he's leaning back and forth. And I didn't know what to do. But what do you think I did? I looked at him. I spoke his name. I'm not going to tell you his name because you keep these things private. And I said, name. I said, you can fill in your name. I didn't say a word to him. I just said his name and I pointed up to the crucifix. This is like right before he was going to be called up to baptism. That squirmy, squirrely kid looked up at that crucifix and he suddenly calmed down, completely calm. It was a new man as he looked up at Jesus suffering for him. And then he went up and he received baptism. Well, Good news, people. In your baptism and in the baptism of your children, Jesus comes to meet you with his death and resurrection and the power of his death and resurrection. All the power and wisdom of God that's in the cross and resurrection of Christ is placed by the blessing of the church into that water. And so when the water came over you, Jesus did come inside of you. And when you were confused and not knowing where to turn, the wisdom of the love of Jesus on the cross prevailed. And when you were restless and squirmy, like that third grader that we brought to baptism here at St. Babel's, peace can come over your restlessness by the power of the cross. We have a children's song. The one way to peace is the power of the cross. His banner over me is love. Well, yeah, that's the key. So baptism, you can describe it as a tangible encounter with the risen Jesus in which he unites us to himself, makes us participants in his death and resurrection, a new life, pardons our sins, and makes us adopted children of God. Think about that. The word tangible. That means he comes through my senses. We feel the water. Okay? Uh, there's many other senses that come into play in the uh, ceremony of baptism. The lighting of the candle. The blessing of the oil. Uh, the oil blessing. The, the sign of the cross on the forehead. Um, but... It's all, it's touchable, it's tangible. That's what a sacramental encounter is about. It's a, it's a, it, he comes to us through our senses. There's nothing 
in our intellect except that comes through our senses. And so we need a sensible uh, religion that's revealed by God. And God in his mercy has given us that in the sacraments and especially in the sacrament of baptism. It's a tangible encounter with Jesus. Now, the key wisdom about encounter is this. Trust. You have to trust the encounter with Jesus. And there's two things that get in the way of that encounter, in my experience. Okay? There's a number of things, but two things I want to think about today. There's this thinking that the encounter is magic. Okay, that somehow it, it, it's a magical encounter. Okay, and I mean, in our immaturity, we sometimes do think about our religious encounters as magic. And then that leads to sort of a compulsion toward the encounters. Um, my favorite story about that is I, I had a, a sixth grade child who had a brace that he had to always wear uh, because of his birth defect. And he was being brought to me for baptism. And he met with me the first time he met with me. And he said, I can't take this brace off. So, and, I, and the brace, the doctors told me the brace couldn't get wet. So he said, you're going to have to get the pastor to do a magic spell. And I said to him, the first time I met with him, I was meeting with him over at the school. And I said to him, this is the Catholic Church. And I we don't do magic spells. And of course, I found out from his parents that uh, he could take the brace off the, the night of his baptism and he could be baptized without damaging the brace. Uh, he, could, he could not wear the brace for an hour or so while we had the baptism. Um, but you see... It's like the, 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 there was a Christian song in the 1980s. It's not magic, it's Jesus. And, that, and that, that summarizes it. You have to trust Jesus. Like uh, the theologian John Donne quoting uh, Jim Henson, who wrote The Muppets. He has a, uh, a, a book, uh, I guess it's called The Dark Crystal. And in this book, there's a line that, that fits this. Now they had to trust each other or else the world transformed by their chance meeting would become a place without meaning or future after all, a place merely of chance. In other words, out through that door of trust in Christ and in the people that Christ has put us in, uh, put into our lives, we learn uh, uh, to come through the gate of the sacraments of baptism. And the other thing that gets in the way is law. Okay, so magic and law. And what I mean by law getting in the way is we get so hung up on arguing about the meaning of things, we forget to trust. And we, we place our trust in uh, f faulty human wisdom about law rather than trusting in the person of Christ and trusting in the people of God that Christ has raised up to bless us. And then suddenly our religion becomes a matter of magic and law and we miss Jesus. This, this really does happen to people. And I want to say it's this experience of adhering to Christ in the sacrament of baptism, in the experience of moving through uh, baptism to the death and resurrection of Christ, uh, frees us from thinking about religion in terms of magic or law. And I really do believe that. Um, once we get past that point, we realize it's all about relationships. Primarily, of course, our friendship with Christ, our friendship uh, with the Lord, but the Lord's 
Friendship is a fountain that's revealed through our friendship with other people. Remember last time in my first talk, I talked about um, catechism leading us to eternal love. And I emphasized the fact that when I was tempted to become judgmental and legalistic, a very a wiser Christian than myself came to me and said, Gus, don't be a judge, be a friend. Because friendship is the only gift that lasts. Friendship is the eternal gift. That's what he told me. And I've tried, not always successfully, to live out of that wisdom. But I must say, uh, 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 the, the waters can go deep. And the challenge of that word can continually challenge me, even though I heard that advice when I was in my 30s. And I'm now in my 60s, and I'm still trying to deepen the wisdom of that advice. Well, it is about relationships, though. And uh, uh, you can see that the baptismal experience of us as Christians is just loaded with relational wisdom. And so we bring ourselves uh, uh, and our children to this font of baptism. And uh, I want to remind people, parents especially, that you can do little things to remind your children of the blessing of their baptism. Can you bless them by marking a sign of uh, the cross on their forehead? Maybe when you bless them when they go to sleep or bless them at other times that way? I remember in one household I knew, uh, the father would bless the children on their way out to school and work. Uh, I mean, he would take holy water and bless his kids that way. The other thing I've seen people do, uh, we didn't do it in, our, in my family, but we, uh, we would, the, some families I was uh, privileged to live with, they would bring out the children's baptismal candle and celebrate the actual day of their baptism as well as their birthday, if you can imagine. So every child in that family celebrated two dates, not just one. I guess uh, it didn't matter in my family because I was baptized on the same day I was born because they didn't think I would live. So I was baptized right away. Uh, and uh, by the grace of God, fortunately, by the medical technology, I was saved. And uh, I'm here at 64 to, to tell this, to share this. But you can do many things uh, to remind your child that they are a beloved child of God. Key thing, when we're baptized, we're trying all the time to the listen to the voice of love that tells you from the Father, through Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit, that you are God's beloved child. Thank you very much.